Hi, welcome um, people from around the world to our webinar, What to Do Now That You Haven't Matched. Um, why are we here today? We're here because there are many, many, many of you wonderful doctors that spent your life dreaming about practicing medicine in America and did not see the competitive nature or uh, firsthand until this past match season. So we're here to support you and give you advice on how you can um, become a better candidate, how you can maintain hope and give you proper guidance. So what you're gonna learn this uh, day is what leaders look for that make the decisions. Meaning in a curriculum vitae, what do they see as far as commitment, perseverance, passion? And um, what you need in order to differentiate your candidacy, I have a lot of chairman, deans, program director friends. They have 30, 40 positions and over 5,000 applicants. And Dr. Madasha will uh, attest to that. How do you differentiate yourself? Um, and how do you get the attention to seven and a half seconds that they have to shift through your paperwork? Because these are practicing physicians. They have a whole ca caseload of patients. They have to teach. It's one of the most underappreciated jobs uh, in all of, all of jobs, if you will, is a graduate medical education leaders. And um, such leader I'd like to introduce uh, at this moment is Dr. Madaster. He is an esteemed, esteemed academic doctor, runs a robust research system helping humanity, and is in charge of a program in Florida as program director. And uh, a a program that is esteemed and that is one of the top programs. So thank you for taking the time, Dr. Madasar, for being our guest and giving some advice to people that are really down and out. And you know, in your life, you're constantly paying it forward. So thank you for paying it forward uh, this morning as I know you're busy and you have a few minutes with us. And our second distinguished guest is Dr. Gritej Daliwal. So Dr. Gritej Daliwal came to me, he needed help, on achieving residency. And um, what I said is come and work for me. So he came and he worked for me for many months. When, he when I first met him, his hands would shake and he would sweat. He'd be worried about his accent. He'd be worried about his communication. I said, come, let's build your confidence. And he did all the things he was supposed to do. He did his step two, he did his step three, he networked and he got to um, work under my tutelage and mentorship that opened up doors for him through my foundation. And this past mat, uh, match season, he achieved a categorical residency at a university program in New York. And um, he's a, one thing he has is commitment, dedication, and heart. You cannot fabricate, you cannot duplicate when people that are astute, like Dr. Madaster, when they see a person's heart and if their heart is after medicine and if there'll be someone that they can deal with for three years, for 80 hours a week, right? This is someone that you spend more time than you do with your children, with anybody. So it, it, the matter of the interconnectability and being able to get along and blend in well is very important. So um, the Q and A's are open, so you can submit your questions on the right bar. And um, you can always contact us at Residence Medical via live chat, our website, and um, we're happy to give you free advice and uh, guide you in a direction that uh, hopefully you can be in the position of Dr. Madasar uh, by, uh, or, and in, in a more junior in the position of Dr. Gertaj, who one day hopefully will sh uh, follow in the footsteps of Dr. Madasar as his uh, passion is to help people. So kindly, um, if you would um, introduce yourself, Dr. Gertaj, and I'd say the best for last, Dr. Madasar in the end, and then we'll talk a little about what we look for in a curriculum vitae and what to do now. The season is gone. What to do now from a few five, six months short of uh, the new season coming up in September. So uh, Dr. Gershaliwal, kindly. And thank you for uh, doing this. Thank you, Dr. Ares. Thank you. Thank you for uh, this opportunity uh, for having me to the webinar today. It really feels an honor to do that. So, um, I'll start that I am an old graduate. I graduated from Government Medical College, Patiala, Punjab in India in 2016. I have like average scores with one attempt, 
and with minimal research experience. <coughs> then I came to residence medical and uh, they helped me, they tutored me, they mentored me, guided me through the process. And uh, in my time there with Residence Medical and Everest Foundation, I had a chance to interact with uh, like thousands of candidates from across the world with different scenarios, different problems, and different uh, what do you call hurdles to cross in order to achieve residency here in the US. Like when an IMG, I believe when an IMG start, uh, the, his or her journey and for residency in U.S., they believe that it's just U.S. MLEs and a couple of months of rotations or one or two months of research with the publications and it's done. But what I have experienced and uh, by my own and uh, by talking to the candidates, it's like for one program, there are like 10 to 15 seats and over 3,500 or 4,000 applicants applying. So technically speaking, the chances are really less than 1% for a candidate to match into an ACGME, Aggregated Residency Program here in the US. And everyone throughout the world who have their dream to pursue residency in the US, they are done with their US ML exams. Everyone has like one, two or three months of rotations with lack of recommendation. What I believe are some of the factors that can put you forward or that can pull you back in the candidacy. like. There are unmodifiable factors like uh, you cannot do much about your attempts, low scores, old year of graduation, any uh, gaps in your CV or in your MSPE. And there are like modifiable factors like you can do hands on rotation in a teaching hospital residency program, do research. Uh, build, revamp your paperwork, your EDAS application, do good in your interviews, like get interview preparations. So there are a couple of things that a candidate can do to achieve residency. And these are the things that I also did because like I told you, I was an old grad with an attempt and with average scores. So in order to uh, achieve residency here in the uh, U.S., there has to be a person, a mentor who has to be by you 24 seven, because what I believe it's difficult to change a state, but when you change a country and you have to adapt to new medical system, like we changed, I am from India, coming to US to achieve residency, there is a lot of guidance that is needed from time to time. And I thank Residence Medical for this opportunity in FS Foundation to be with me 24 seven. You're very welcome. Now, uh, the esteemed Dr. Uh, Madasar, how can uh, these ca these students out there that are listening to every, hanging on to every word that you would say, how can they overcome red flags or how can they make their CV stronger in these few short months? And uh, kindly a little about yourself so that, um, so that people can know that you've walked the walk, you've walked the struggle, but you never gave up and now you're a leader in one of the most difficult healthcare systems in, in the country, if not the world. Hey, sir. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Evers, for giving this opportunity. It's always a pleasure to talk and help people out. I'm a foreign medical graduate, never, never was ashamed of saying it. And just to let everybody know that I got matched. Uh, I did not get matched. When I applied for my residency, I had no mentor. I wish I had a mentor like you, Ben, who's guiding people. I did not get matched back in the day. I was depressed, demoralized. I just one interview in soap, and that's how I got in. That's 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 how I got in. And uh, the only thing I did different, I'm going to share my experience, and then I'll tell you what we look for globally as program directors. Uh, you know what to do. And um, that's um, uh, so. What I did different during my soap because I did not have any. You know, the biggest thing I would say is um, my which I lacked during my when I. Uh, submitted my application versus when I applied is was my research. I did not have any research. My scores were good, but I did not have any research. I, I applied to big centers, not knowing which what's the difference between, you know, and a foreign medical graduate friendly program versus the other. Uh, applied to Ivy's League schools because um, med school uh, med programs because, you know, and it never took foreign medical graduates. So and, and had no no clue where I was doing. Uh, I obviously messed up my uh, rank order list as well. So, you know, um, um, like uh, 
uh, you know, it was just stated that, you know, you need a mentor, you need a mentor to guide you every step of the way. So uh, the biggest thing I did at that time, uh, you know, uh, sir, was that I made sure I had my publications. And, you know, when I went for the interview, it was my interview who got me over there because all I talked about was what I did and what I can bring to the program because my program director who later hired me as my faculty in the same program, he later on told me, he said that you gave such a good interview that, you know, you were going on, uh, you led the interview. It's not that we led the interview, you led the interview because they talked to, you know, but the opening you know, question is that everybody asks is, tell me about yourself. So you start from there and then you, I stopped at the research and this is what I'm doing. And what I did is I, I, I did a background, you know, check I, on, I mean, not background check, excuse me. I went, all, uh, I went through all the publications of all the faculty who were going to interview me. So I knew their interest before coming in. Again, this was through a mentor. Uh, my uh, professor who was uh, doing research with me told me this. He told me I, uh, during the soap, I said, I wish you would have told me earlier. So, <laughs> he, so I knew that my program director was infectious disease, so he likes that. One was had specially, you know, he was a he was a cardiologist. He was our associate program director. One was a pulmonologist. So I knew their, you know, backgrounds, and I told them that these these are three things are doing. I was doing ID. I did I, I did I I, um, I presented a case of ID. I was doing research in uh, what you call pulmonology, critical care, and then part of cardiology as well. So they knew that you know uh, they were very intrigued by you know when they asked me questions, and that's what we all discussed about is what I did. So. Giving the interviews art as well, because like, you know, it, you know, it was just said that, you know, um, everybody's uh, like that. Uh, Daniwal said that, you know, everybody looks same on the paper. Everybody's got scores. Everybody got research experience. Everybody has got, you know, two, three months of training. However, um, if you want to just uh, what we look for um, during that, like you said, seven minutes to review that application, of course, if you have deficiencies in your score, the way that you compensate it, because now we are after the match, everything is done, what do you do? My recommendation is, and I think you give the same recommendation as well, is get step three out of the way, because that's a good seller, and do proper research. Two, three months of research doesn't count. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't even look at that. If you do at least six to eight months of proper research, you know, like a research coordinator, like a research, you know, um, publish something, get your hands dirty with clinical trials. I tell this um, uh, to everybody and I'm, I shared it with you. I'm going to share it with you as well. I got my residency because I was used to work as a clinical coordinator. That research helped me get into faculty because I had the maximum research when they were hiring. And that's researched. I still do research like you introduced. I have a big clinical uh, uh, trial center where we do research over here, where all our, you know, most of our uh, research, our, uh, our clinical coordinators are, are from our, uh, what you call foreign medical graduates. And um, we, I, I, I like helping people. I would love them. And um, of all the people who did uh, research except for one, everybody got residency this year. So oh. um, um, they got to go to that. Uh, so this is what I would say. Do find out, you know, and through obviously um, what you call the resident medical, find a place where you can do proper research, um, get good letter recommendations. OK, and um, don't give up. I would I would never say give up. I, I, I give you my example as my example. I did not get matched. Got it. That's got wonderful. Yeah. That's wonderful inspiration, Dr. Madhasa. Yeah. And it just really shows because the input you give in your in your research um, environment and your research facility, you're doing it uh, gratis. You're doing it for free for them, help them to give them this this exposure. Yes. That's that's amazing. Mm -hmm. And I've seen you how you just study the research and you look at the person's character, and it's it's just an amazing thing that we have leadership that looks beyond the uh, nonsense of um, elitism and looks mm -hmm. at the individual. And that's what we see in you. And yeah. that's what really we do at Residence Medical. We're an educational organization that helps really prepare the CV or rehabilitate mm -hmm. the CV. And that comes with time. There's no shortcuts with that. And no. that comes really proving yourself. There's exactly. people like Dr. that have spent years. So if you come to him and say, oh, there's one time I didn't match, two times I didn't match, or I want to get in right away, he's like, Go spend six, eight months. You'll get, go, go pay your due. So really what to do now in these few short months, don't sit at home. Gaps in CV are career suicide. 
get out there, get into a program, um, get into real clinical. Don't do observerships and remote research. That's not going to help you. Show dedication that you're sacrificing. And that's where we can come in and help you and, and uh, introduce you to a really robust way of getting exposure, integrating within a program so that you are with the people that make the decisions and you get to prove yourself is really a a uh, differentiating factor, but it's very difficult because so many people are trying to get in the same way. The, the medical school students are trying to get into the research the same way. So, it, it, you know, you need, you need a partner, you need a mentor that can help navigate. What we're going to do now is we're going to take one or two questions because Dr. Madaster has to leave. So if someone has a question and then Dr. Dhaliwal and I will stay for about five, 10 minutes and um, we'll call it a day. And one more thing, uh, Dr. Everest. Like yes, Dr. Daniwal said, you need a good mentor. You need a good mentor every step of the way who can guide you. Like I said again, I'm going to say it again. I wish I had somebody like, like you, but if I but if I had you, I would not be here right now. I would be someplace else. <laughs> <laughs> it was all God's will, and now you are uh, exactly God, yes. where you need to be. And it's it's you know it's uh, it's right. a beautiful thing. And um, yeah, guys, there is a if you're IMG FMG, there's a discrepancy. Don't go apply to, uh, to, to Massachusetts General. They have their own system. You have to know where to apply, even if your scores are 270. So um, you, this type of navigation, you really get one or two chances, and then people start wondering, why didn't he achieve residency? And then you start going backwards. So, yeah, the mentorship is very, very important, very, very important. Um, do we have any questions to uh, go to uh, with our um, attendees? I'm looking at the uh, Q&A. So here's a question. How important is it for me to do hands-on clinical versus observerships? Versus, excuse me? Uh, how important is it for me to do hands-on clinical versus observerships? Okay. So um, obviously hands-on clinical is better, but because, you know, of certain state laws, not, you know, all states offer it not all hospitals offer it so i if you get it great a lot of you know programs look for it i don't literally prepare, look for hands-on experience but if you get it that's super that's great that's gonna ha uh, that's gonna you know really really um, stand you out but uh, never underestimate research i cannot uh, go over the fact that research will help you and again a longitudinal research for you have one year Till uh, next match, commit yourself somewhere to a research center for one year. It will do wonders for you. I mean, I'll give you a, a, a small snippet. I had one resident. She was like eight, uh, six years, seven years out of residency. Okay. I mean, she did not make through the filter. I'll be honest with you. Her mentor, Dr. Otto, she, he was the guru of AFib in this country. Okay. He wrote me an email. He said, if you can give this girl a chance, she will not disappoint you. When such a prestigious guy is, you know, calling you at a, such a high from, I mean, I've listened to his lectures. I, he, he's the guru of AFib in this country. So he calls me up. I, be, I share it with my faculty. Our selection committee says, okay, let's give her. She gave such a in, good interview. Her And she published in um, Circulation and American College of Cardiology Journal with obviously his, you know, what you call uh, name. So she got in and now she is practicing, uh, you know, uh, up in the same state uh, where she did research. So um, it's this is just one story. I know she was met with such a high guy. You don't have to find such a high, high guy. But if somebody can, you know, uh, uh, you know, email for you or call for you, that's, again, a, a big pointer. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's that. That right there is so important by having an advocate that will pick up the phone. Uh, the medical community, especially the GME community, is a very small community. If someone's going to pick up the phone and lobby for you, and it's no longer a decision of just the program director. That was our old days. You know, we've been around 25 yep. years. Now you have a whole committee, a whole democratic system. So you have to convince everybody in that committee that you are going to be a benefit to the hospital. And, and again, one more question. sorry, before sorry. that girl, she committed for one, two, one and a half year with that guy, with that doctor. So it's not just two weeks that, you know, he picked up the phone and called for her. He saw her commitment. He saw her longitudinal commitment. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, there's, and, and that's that's the backing, like just this past, um, 
just this past season, I had a, a, a program director call me and there's this, this uh, single mother and she needs help. But the fact that he asked me to help her, I'm like, okay, we'll make something happen. And that's really what it takes is someone to believe in you that's higher up the ladder that you've sacrificed under the tutelage of that sees your struggle. People that yep. have heart, they see struggle. And if you're in medicine, by nature, you have a heart because you care about people and you uh, you, you, you care about their well-being in their life. We have one more question, Dr. Um, Madasha, and then I'll kindly, I know you have rotations to do, and then Dr. Gutierrez and I will stay, um, if you don't mind, and we'll answer some questions. It says, um, uh, at a ho uh, this is from Ms. Laura, at a hospital, if a hospital doesn't have any IMGs in their system, does it mean that the hospital doesn't support diversity? You first, and then I'll help answer that a little bit too kindly. So if they haven't had IMGs, um, the sort IMG system, it means the hospital doesn't support diversity. Uh, <laughs> that, that, that's, um, you know, I would uh, quote, a, that's, a, that's a loaded question, okay? So, <laughs> but, but I'll answer it. Um, you know, there's certain policies and procedures, you know, which go like the Ivy League schools, you know, they don't take IMGs. I'll be honest with you. Ivy League schools don't take uh, foreign medical graduates. You have to be a superstar to get in there, do research with them, you know, have them back up or something. There's, they just don't, don't take it because they want to support their school. Remember, the, you are you are practicing in a country which has to support their own graduates first. You have to acknowledge that. Like Dr. You know, Danival was saying that you the system is different over here. Okay, so they will. It's not that they will not take it, but um, now a lot of Ivy schools are taking. Clinton Clinic is taking a lot of uh, foreign medical graduates. Okay. So uh, it's not that, but yes, the usual rule is, it's not that they're to support diversity. If you look at their roster, they'll have people from all races, okay? They're, but they are all U.S. graduates, unfortunately. So picking a, a U.S. graduate versus IMG is not, you know, being not being diverse. It's just their, their, their rule that they selected. But they have a lot of people from all backgrounds um, who are U.S. Uh, unfortunately, they have to be U.S. graduates. That's that's. Um, and that's how they, you know, laid down the system, because when they sit down, like you were saying, the committee sits down, they make a pact that, OK, they make the ground rules. Then they're higher up. My like my boss, who is the DIO, who is the, responsible for all the programs in in the hospital. He makes a decision that this is where we're going to go from moving on forwards. So um, it's it's not just one man's decision. It's everybody's. But again, that's not true that they're not diverse because diversity is um, from uh, is can be taken from all uh, from different angles as well. Well, you've hit the nail right on the head. Yeah. Diversity doesn't mean IMG versus you know yep. black, brown, white, this and that. Um, they have diversity, and and now more than ever, the thing is this. Now you have more jail schools opening up, more U.S. medical schools. So, yes, they have to encapsulate their own. And plus, if you're going to Cornell or Harvard, you're paying up to a half a million dollars in medical school tuition. So they have to have make sure their people get in. But if you're going to go do research for two years there, you may get in a community-based program that they work yes. with. Yes, yes. You know, but at the end of the day, it's you have to know the parameters and where to where you will fit in best. That culture you may not fit in either. So you want to fit in the culture properly. And exactly. um, diversity really consists of different types of mentality, different types of um, different type of life experiences. Mm -hmm. More than so IMG. One more thing, Dr. Everest. Um, now it's, it's AC, ACGME, our governing body, mandates that there should be diversity in the program diversity in the hospital, it's everywhere. I have to prove it that we are a diverse program. Oh, no, absolutely. Every program, not just me. Everybody has to prove it. Yeah, yeah, no, th thank you for that. I know you have to run, Dr. Madasa. Thank you so much for your valuable time. No, it's always time. a pleasure, and sir. It's always all a pleasure. You do that, you Good luck and God bless yeah. to everybody. And um, like I do. said, if um, Dr. Everest, my doors are open. If everybody's looking for research, I do require commitment for one year, nothing less than that. So if everybody's committed, by all means, I'll help anybody out. Okay? Thank no you, sir. Okay. God bless everybody. Bye. Take you. care. Bye-bye. God bless. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a um, couple of questions that uh, we'll answer with Dr. Um, I have, um, I have a, um, a question from Ms. Purva. How to get enlisted for clinical trials? Well, the way you get enlisted is if you're going to pick up the phone and call with 50 people ahead of you, 
Um, Residence Medical can help you because we'll find the right program compared to your bio data and how you look on paper and put you in a community-based program, a university program. Um, there's programs that'll support visas, programs that won't. So really um, give us a call and we'll be able to help and guide you and uh, see how we can help you. Um, thank you for that question, Ms. Perva. And um, another question we have is from Mr. Um, uh, Awasi uh, six minutes ago. How well do working at research as a research coordinator help in the match? Uh, will it be proper to ask for an LOR from a PI that I'm working with as a study coordinator? Dr. Dalwal, uh, would you kindly answer that? Yes, thank you, Dr. Evans. So, yeah, so working as a research coordinator definitely gives you an edge compared to other candidates who just got in, who are fresh graduates. Maybe the thing is that who have only one or two months of research experience and definitely 110% you can ask for a letter because like Dr. Mudasir mentioned, so he needs a commitment for a year or more than that. So if you are working in a facility, doing research, doing some publications, presenting, uh, doing some oral presentation. Yes, definitely you can ask for a letter of recommendation from your PI. But what I believe is you have to be, you have to uh, give your 100%, right? So the letters will depend upon your performance. Like it has to be performance based. Like if, how can we differentiate it? Like, is it more personalized or geared towards yourself or is more generalized? That will depend upon how much input did you give it. So to answer the question, yes, you can ask for a letter of recommendation and being a research coordinator definitely helps you to be uh, a little bit ahead than the candidates who are applying or the candidates who have only one or two months of research experience. Wonderful. So proud of you, Dr. Daliwa, how you answer these questions now and how um, you're really, really, uh, really dear to uh, my heart and the whole organization's heart. So. I want to answer this question. Um, this is from Mr. S uh, this is from Saeed. I don't know if Mr. Miss. How late can one get a residency position in post -match? So That's a good question. So what I did last year is um, I, I help people get a medical residency for a 23 start from now all post match from now all the way until September. There's positions that open up that because my students have prepared and done well in the past in those programs, that the program will call me and say, do you have anybody with these and these parameters? So uh, you can get a position as late as September, but a lot of these positions go unpublished. One PD will call another, or they'll call me, or they'll call my foundation, or resident doctor and say, do you have somebody good that you can, that you can recommend? Or they take somebody that's doing research there. So you can get a position all the way up until September, of this year for a July part. You know, you just make it up in the back end for those two months. And we're going to be helping people. We just helped somebody last week achieve their dream residency. So to answer your question, um, Saeed, yes, you can get one all the way up until September of 23 for a July 23 start. Um, if, yes, great. Uh, one more question is, and then we're going to end this soon here is um, how to overcome filters for attempts and low scores. So I'm going to take a shot at that, and then I'm going to actually, you know what, you go for it, Dr. Dalibon. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harris. So uh, just to, uh, like, there are IMGs, FMGs, and even American grads who have a little bit like red flags, maybe in the form of low scores or attempts. So uh, just to make things clear, yes, you cannot mask or cover your attempts because whenever a program asks for USMLE transcript, so your scores, dates, how how much you scored, your attempts, everything should uh, will be written on that, right? Like I explained before, it's a non-modifiable factor, right? But what you can uh, present is during your interview or during your time doing research or clinicals, there is like that is one day. Right. One day of your low scores or attempts. I mean, that one day cannot express how you are as a person, how you are as a physician. Right. So you have to uh, be like 100 percent there. You have to express yourself. Be like patient friendly. Be like people friendly. People should uh, feel confident. Patients should feel confident interacting with you. And they should have a good rapport, a good faith in you. So. To answer this question, 
we cannot as such mask attempts, but we can uh, overcome it by proving ourselves to the program, to the community. Absolutely. Um, what you have to do is what we call it a um, rehabilitation program at Residence Medical. So what we would do is we'd make sure you have all of your board, your shelf exams done. We would make sure that you integrate within a program. So now you're having an interaction. You're having the weekend basketball games with the, with the resident. You're getting to know the attendings, having barbecues. And they get to know how you are, your temperament. And also we do things like if we're internal medicine, we'll have our student take the ITE, the in-training service exam, prepare you for it. So now you've gotten one attempt on step two, which step two is everything now. Um, one attempt on step three, and you're a 2018 graduate, right? So how are you gonna counteract that? Program, I will pass the board. Let me show you my IT score. It is 70%, which only residents take, but because programs uh, work as closely, they allow our students to take it. So now you're counteracting. This is how I've grown as a candidate. I've grown by this is where I started. I never gave up. And now I've taken an in-training service exam that only residents take, gotten a high score. You've, been, you've seen me day in, day out from nine months to a year. Give me a chance. And it's hard to say no to somebody that you know and that you like and that they see you working. Like um, you're the first to get there, the last one to leave. I'll give you a small example. Dr. Dollywall used to drive two and a half hours every day to come uh, to the uh, headquarters here at Residence Medical. Never complained, was excited, worked hard, stayed late, and I observed that, right? So he went on and he got a um, interview at a program that we have a, a deep, deep relationship with in New York. And the dean called and asked me, he said, hey, I see that, um, that, um, that um, this is someone that you know. And I gave him a roaring, roaring recommendation because I saw firsthand how he is, right? Nothing takes the place of commitment, like Dr. Dollywell said, be committed, work hard, be passionate. And um, that's how you overcome them, by going in a program that will be open-minded to the now you, not the old you. And that's what we that's what we help at over here at, at Residence Medical. So I think that we're going to be done with the questions. Basically, um, submit your questions, get on live chat, call the offices, and um, we have our residency um, specialist counselors to help you and guide you. And yes, we will have positions that are available post match for qualified uh, uh, candidates, but that's a rarity. We need you to integrate. We're an education organization. You come, you build your CV, you get your exposure and integration, and open the door for you. It's your job to walk in that door and close uh, close the door with you as a resident. So um, I want to congratulate you again, Dr. Dollywall. I want to wish you the best. I know you're going to be a cardiologist soon and uh, after residency and enjoy your time in New York and uh, many blessings. And you know, if you need anything night or day, uh, I am personally here for you. Resident Medical is for you. Universe Foundation is here for you, and uh, you're very dear to our heart. And uh, all the questions that didn't get answered, ask them offline or um, call the offices or uh, live chat us. And don't give up. There's still a chance this year. You just need the right people on your side. That, that's how I can close it. And uh, kindly have the last words, Dr. Dalimov. Thank you. So lastly, I would like to thank Residence Medical and Everest Foundation for being with me 24 seven, for guiding me, preparing me, mentoring me throughout the journey to achieve residency here in the US. I know, like Dr. Mudassar said, like Dr. Everest said, guidance is really important, right? No doubt I am from India, right? So I did my med school in India and in India, no doubt the person who did the med school, they are preferred there, right? Because they are the citizens there. In US, no doubt the American graduates are preferred, but we can we can achieve residency here in the us with proper guidance and what i believe through my journey and my experience residence medical and everest foundation excel in that thank you thank you thank you, thank you sir blessings to you everybody happy holidays uh this weekend and um just all the best okay thank you so much for joining us and thank you dr Bertage, and thank you dr madasar for your valuable time thank you sir.
Great. Thank you so much. Again, I'm the uh, Dr. Michael Evers, the founder and chairman of Residence Medical. We're here to help you. All you have to do is reach out. Thank you so much.